So a couple things I want to do first. Um, <laughs> church, I get a lot of Christmas cards. <laughs> this one terrified me. <laughs> and he teaches Sunday school in this church. <laughs> and the worst part, but actually the best part about this is I had to text him and I, I put Vince on the text thread just to make sure it didn't get out of hand. And uh, I said, bro, I, I don't know what happened here, but how did you get permission to do this? Because this would be a no-no in the Hearn household for a Christmas card. And he was like, it was actually her idea. <laughs> so I wanted to showcase this to encourage all. This is my favorite Christmas card of all time. <laughs> and, uh, and also wanted to give a plug to the fact that uh, Anthony teaches our uh, Sunday school class here upstairs at 845, uh, and we do that. He does that every Sunday going through 1 John, and uh, I just encourage you, if you like getting up, you want to get a little extra coffee, uh, you will not be disappointed. Uh, there's a lot of blessing there, and he's clearly a very fun guy uh, and, uh, and really knowledgeable of the Word, and so just wanted to give a plug there. Also wanted to, if you've seen uh, the decorations here uh, with the Moody's and the Gillespie's putting all this together, uh, it's just beautiful uh, for this Christmas. And thank them when you see them. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we also have a, what is over there is a photo booth. If you want to have a family picture, you take that. That's all of this we're blessed to be able to keep up through Christmas and uh, so when you come through on Christmas, you can be able to do that on Christmas Eve if you come to worship with us at 5 o'clock then. Um, but, uh, but just thankful for them and all the hard work they've put into making this beautiful as we celebrate the season of Christmas. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 11. So we've got a lot to cover today because I think that this passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at uh, has incredible significance as it relates to our faith, as it relates to our walk with Christ, and really the discovery and unpacking of God's sovereignty uh, and his orchestrating all things for the good of bringing us and restoring us back into right relationship with the Lord. We've all heard and talked about what we would term as the triumphal entry. It's what we celebrate the, the Sunday before Easter on Palm Sunday, where Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, the beginning of the last week of his life, as he's coming and he's going to the cross to lay down his life to be the atoning sacrifice for you and me to take upon our sin. But when you think about a triumphal entry, we have to think about what did that mean to the people in the time? What did that mean to the Romans that were there and a part of this season in this time? Because they had a very different picture of what a triumphal entry was. Whether you were a Roman general or whether you were the emperor, in order to have what would be deemed a triumphal entry, you had to have a victory in battle. But not only did you have to have a victory in battle, but you had to defeat 5,000 soldiers in an effort to be able to have a triumphal entry, to be able to come into a city to showcase your victory. So it would be a victory that would come in and the emperor or the general and whoever would come in on white horses and they would come in and coming in with all of their, the, the spoils of their victory, right? And even behind them would come the prisoners and others that they would showcase through as they're coming victorious on their white horses, people celebrating for their victory, but also them coming and boasting and what they had done and what they had accomplished. Whether they were heading to the temple of Jupiter to offer sacrifices as they come in, Others would come in and they would lead and they would send those prisoners into a fight for their life against wild beasts. But either way, when they would come in, they would, sacrifices would be made, death would ensue, but it would be a symbol of war and victory. That looks nothing like what Jesus did. Because what Jesus came to do, he came in, in a very different, but yet very extraordinary way and what I would even say a very calculated and determined way. And he did it humbly for you and for me. And so let's look at Mark chapter 11 and let's look at the triumphal entry. But I just wanted to paint a picture for you what the people would have expected of a triumphal entry. But then now let's get a picture of what Jesus shows us as a triumphal entry. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 11, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples 
And he said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And so when we look to this, we see where Jesus is. He's probably staying with Mary and Martha and Lazarus over there in Bethany. And when you come up, and when you come up onto the Mount of Olives, you're coming up, and you're at about 2,600 feet above sea level. And you're able to look out, and having been able to be there, and you look over, and you're looking out, and you can see the temple sitting up on that mountaintop. And as you think about Jesus coming up over the Mount of Olives, and he is looking towards Jerusalem, looking towards the temple, and looking towards what he's going to do. But in order to go, in order to do this, he's making preparations. One of the things I love about Jesus is that in Jesus' life and his purpose, he always wants to bring us in. He doesn't need us. He doesn't have to have us. But he invites us in to participate. And here he asked two disciples, and we don't know which two it was, but he asked them to go into the village. And as they go into it, he gives them instructions to go find a colt. And why this is significant is because it fulfills a prophecy of Scripture in Zechariah 9.9. Where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here we see Jesus orchestrating even fulfillment of prophecy here with the triumphal entry and how he's going to enter. He's not entering on a white horse like the Roman soldiers and the generals would as they were coming in. He's coming in on a donkey. A donkey is a symbol of peace. A horse is a symbol of war. Jesus is coming as a symbol of peace. And he's inviting people to participate in the work. I don't know what arrangements Jesus made here and and, and maybe working with the owner of this colt in order to be taken But either way, Jesus gave them a command, and and wisely these men went and followed. And then in verse 4 it says, And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And when I read this and I hear, you know, it's so funny how when you think about if we just actually did what Jesus commanded us to do, how it just works out conveniently enough, right? But so oftentimes we hear and read the word of the Lord and we, we read it, but yet we want to try to still continue to say, that's good, but I think I got a better plan. Jesus, let me go do mine. But here we see these men faithfully doing what the, what the Lord had commanded them to do and all was well and all went well. It's interesting, if we actually would listen to the sovereign Lord who's created all things, knows the beginning from the end, as orchestrating everything for the good of us as we pursue him and we give our lives to him, that might be a God I'd want to follow and I'd want to listen to and I'd want to com- obey their commands. But here we see these individuals doing this and then laying their cloaks on the colt for Jesus to sit upon. And spreading the cloaks out under a person was in recognition of their royalty. You see this in the Old Testament with the King Jehu, where they laid down the the blankets, where they laid down for him in symbolism of his kingship and recognizing who he was. And not only did the disciples do this, but others are going to gather in. As it says in verse 8, it says, And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. We know that in John's gospel, it speaks to these as palm branches that we know as we think about Palm Sunday. And it says, and those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, they said, which is save us, we pray. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Speaking of Psalm 118. Celebrating Jesus coming in. Obviously not coming in with the grandeur of a Roman general or a Roman emperor. But he's coming in declaring himself for the first time, his kingship, giving recognition to the worship of the people for who he was and what he was going to do. And it says, and he entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. 
So he came and he scoped everything out. He came in and, and through his triumphal entry, people worshiping and praising his name and what he had come to do. And I believe that many still chaining his name were still unsure of the plan that God had for Jesus' life. Wanting him to come and establish an earthly kingdom, wanting to come and overcome Rome so that they could establish their, their own kingdom once again. But Jesus goes away in preparation. Now this is around the time of Passover. So you have to understand that there were about 2 million people making their way into this area during this time. It was very crowded. Many, many people were around to check out what was happening in during this time. But when you think about Jesus and you think about this triumphal entry, we look to this and we see what's happening. But yet, if we're honest with ourselves, okay, nice. He goes in, he's riding on a donkey, and people are celebrating and declaring his name and praising him and all of this. And, you know, what's so special? What's so grand about this? Why is the triumphal entry? What, what significance, what power does it bring to us, to our faith, and to our life? There's several things that I, that I want us to really come away with when we think about the triumphal entry. Number one, we have to recognize that this entry is a symbol of peace. There's a big difference, yes, represented in the donkey, but there's representation in so much more. And we talked about this last week when we talked about Jesus and coming in peace and, and the sacrifice that he made, it would bring us peace in Isaiah 53, where it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his wounds were healed. So Jesus is coming as a symbol of peace not as a symbol of war. That is a time to come. That is a time where Jesus comes and we read in Revelation, he will come on his white horse. He will come tatted up. You might be uncomfortable with that. I get it for some of you, but hey, the scripture teaches he's got a tattoo on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on his thigh. And he is coming to rule and to reign and to establish the kingdom of God forever when he comes again, amen? But here he's coming differently. He's coming as a symbol of peace because it is the pathway of peace that leads to our salvation, that leads to us being restored into right relationship with God. Because if he does not come in peace, when he comes in war, we all fall short of the glory of God and are not received into the kingdom of God. He had to come this way first. And he comes as a symbol of peace. But also there's some symbolism here that I think is fascinating. And when you go back into the Old Testament, you think about David because it's through the son of David, right? It's through the lineage of David that the Messiah would come. And when it comes to David, it comes to his life, David wanted to build the temple for God. And the temple was a representation of God's presence among the people. It was where he dwelt. And David wanted to do that. But why could David not build the temple? Because there was too much shed blood on his hands. Because of all the war that David did. And so what did God do? He said, I'm going to build it through your son, Solomon. Now listen to this about Solomon. When Solomon is anointed king and he comes in to be anointed, do you know what he comes into Jerusalem on? Church, he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. Listen to these words in 1 Chronicles 22 about Solomon. It says, behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. And you think about Solomon. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies, and for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. Church, not only is this speaking to Solomon coming in and, and reigning for 40 years and experiencing great peace, throughout his reign. But I also believe this is a prophetic picture of what Jesus would come and do. But he can't come in the shedding. He can't come in war. He has to come in peace. And he comes establishing peace by waging war against sin and by taking on sin for us. The triumphal entry gives us peace because he's going to accomplish the will of God. He's going to do the work of God, the promise of God that is to be given to humanity for us to see when we give our, put our faith and trust in Christ. So we see this as a symbol of peace. 
a symbol that the nation of Israel would have understood and knew through Solomon and through David and understanding the varying difference in how God works. But God's presence came through peace. The temple was built by Solomon, a representation in a time of peace. Our relationship with God is what gives us peace. It's not circumstantial peace. It's having peace with God is the peace that he's talking about. That peace that surpasses all understanding, it's not the peace of your circumstance. It's knowing that you are at peace with God no matter what your circumstance is. And because of what Jesus had come and accomplished and what he did. What else do we need to take away from the triumphal entry? I truly believe this shows God's deliberate pursuit of us. And I want to explain that a little bit. If you go to Luke's gospel, so the triumphal entry is in all four gospels, which gives it its great significance and meaning as it is descriptive in all. But Luke gives a, a greater discussion about Jesus' experience coming in. And listen to what he writes. And it says, and this is after Jesus had come in, the triumphal entry had taken place. And it says, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for what? Peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. There's several things to really grasp here that I think are really powerful. Number one, you see Jesus weeping. Jesus is weeping over a known outcome. Jesus knew what he'd come to do. He understood why he had to do it and what he was coming to accomplish in the will of God. But even knowing all of this, he still wept over it still sorrowful over the sin, over the rejection of the people. Even though he knew it, his heart still broke. He still cared. He still loved. Even in his sovereignty and understanding, he still cared for those who would reject him, and he knew it. But he still had great love, and he still wept. And here we see this, and it talks, but it talks about, but now they're hidden from your eyes because you couldn't see. Speaking of the prophecy of Isaiah 6, of the blinding their eyes and the hardening of their hearts, due to their unbelief, they didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was. And what would come? As he talks about here, he gives the prophecy of the judgment that would come in 70 AD when everything is destroyed, when the temple is destroyed and wiped away. And here he sees the prophecy, and all this comes from unbelief. The destruction in our own life does not come from our sin or our mistakes. It comes from our unbelief and our refusing to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And here we see the fallout from that is destruction. But when you think about what God's intentions were, what, what, and I think about Joseph, and I think about Joseph back in Genesis, and when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, and years later, after God sovereignly used him to save the people, when the brothers come back and he comes to them, he looks at them, he says, what God intended for good or what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And in doing that, he comforted and he spoke kindly to them. He didn't show bitterness. He didn't show frustration. He understood that even though they did something wrong, God made good of it. And because he understood that God was making good of it, he was able to extend kindness and love to his brothers. And I also think about in our own lives what we think about intending things for evil. God can always make good of it, even when we fall short. But in this situation, we see it flipped. What God intended for good, the people rejected and they made it evil. When you think about in Acts chapter 2, where Peter tells in Acts 3, he says, You crucified and killed the Lord Jesus. It was your sin, your unbelief, your rejection I brought you good. I brought you the promised Messiah. And you rejected him and you killed him. We turn the good things of God and we reject them and we turn them and make it evil because of our rejection and because of our unbelief. But even in the depths of our depravity, God still uses even that 
for good as he brought about salvation for all who believe in him through the wickedness of our sin and putting Jesus to death. But when we see this, there's something that's also really fascinating. He says, but you should have known. If you, would have, you had known on this day the things that make for peace, you should have known this day would come. Why is that so significant? There's a couple things that we need to remember. When you look back in history and you look, it's many believe that the day of Palm Sunday that we celebrate this triumphal entry was actually the 10th day of Nisan. And why is that significant? Because that was the day in Jewish culture where they would go and they would select their unblemished lamb that they would sacrifice on the 14th day of Nisan and for Passover. So if you think about Jesus coming in for the triumphal entry on that very day, was that the day where the people were running around trying to identify and find their one-year-old unblemished lamb that they are going to sacrifice four days later? It's their identifying for them their sacrificial offering. And on that very same day, Jesus is walking in, offering to them the perfect sacrifice for them to see. And would several days later give his own life in the timing of the Passover to be the sacrificial lamb. Just as John the Baptist would say, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when we look at the timing of that, but I think there's something still even more fascinating when we look to this day and we look to the understanding of it. There was a man named Sir Robert Anderson. Sir Robert Anderson wrote a book called The Coming Prince in 1894. And in 1894, Sir Robert Anderson did a lot of research and a lot of study on the prophecy in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Understood as the 70 weeks. It's a time period and understanding of God's sovereign plan that the angel Gabriel was giving to Daniel as a prophecy of understanding. And what he did was Sir Robert looked and studied through Daniel, understanding the prophecy, understanding the times of which things would come to pass and when things would be, taking in the solar calendar, the lunar calendar, and the Judean calendar, Julian calendar, and the Gregorian calendar, all these things I don't know anything about. But he went and he added everything up. And what he came to an understanding of, he says, there was 483 years that would be established, 173,880 days in order from the 69 weeks, because one of the, se- one of the 70 is for the end times, is believed. But for 69 weeks, he gives these dates. But also in looking at the calendar, he goes and says, so when does the clock start as it relates to Daniel 9's prophecy, as it relates to the one who's going to give a decree to rebuild the temple. And through the calendar and through study, this man came up with a date to understand. He said it was March 14th, 445 B.C., when King Artaxerxes gave the decree to build the temple in Esther chapter 7. And if you do the math... From Esther chapter 7, 173,880 days, 483 years, it brings you to the date of April 6, 32 AD. The day that they believe that Jesus came in on the triumphal entry to come to give his life. And when I think about Jesus weeping and saying, you should have known. You should have known that I was coming the prophecy that's to be given here. Now I'm going to give full disclosure. This could straight up be all hogwash. But he did a lot of research, and I would encourage you to look up all of this. But the arguments are very compelling for his study and his research. And for me, at the end of the day, I believe that God sovereignly and purposefully gave this date, declared this date, orchestrated this date, allotted the season and the date and time that it would come because it was, he was coming at the perfect time and the right time to save lost humanity. And he's triumphantly coming in as king. And lastly, when we think about the triumphal entry, it truly reveals the supremacy of Christ. But not in the way that we would think. Not in the picture of him coming in. He didn't come in on his white horse. He didn't come in after having killed thousands upon thousands of people to show his dominance. He comes in on a donkey. He comes in 
to establish and to make peace. But what's extraordinary is what, how he got there. In Colossians chapter 1, it speaks of our Lord in this way. It says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. That in everything he might be supreme. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Here we see Jesus. Here we see he was before all things. Jesus wasn't, his beginning was not in Bethlehem that we're going to celebrate in a week. He has always been. And he's, what is extraordinary about Jesus is how he came and what he came to do. It says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus didn't come to conquer a nation to establish himself as a king. He came to save that which is lost. Church, his supremacy comes through his sacrifice. His supremacy comes through him laying down his power. His supremacy comes by stepping down from heaven, descending to be put on human flesh to accomplish the will of God. His supremacy comes through the love that he loved us by being willing to go to the cross to die for us. All of these things are counter to what we would look to as supreme. He is doing everything. He is flipping the world upside down for us to see that the kingdom that God is establishing through Jesus does not look like one that man can conquer and man can do. It is something that only God can do alone. And his supremacy comes, which I want to end with this verse in John's gospel which will tie in to, East, or to, uh, to Christmas Eve. It says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I think about Ephesians 4.10 where it says, He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all things so that he might fill all things. So Jesus coming and Jesus descending, coming from the highest of highs, the right hand of the Father, coming down to be this perfect sacrifice. But he uses Moses as an example Just as Moses lifted up the serpent out in the desert, out in the wilderness. And why is that significant? Well, you think about the people during that time, they were grumbling and they were arguing with God about his provision, about the food that they were eating, about how things were going for them. They were wandering and they were frustrated and they were angry and they were rejecting God for his provision and what he was saying and what he was doing. It wasn't good enough. And the Lord sent serpents. He sent snakes that began to bite the people in judgment. And many were dying. And the people cried out and they repented to God. And they said, please forgive us. And so so the Lord commanded Moses to go and build a staff and put on it a serpent. And when the people look to the serpent, they can find healing. And then people would go and they would look to the serpent that Moses would stand up and raise up. And the people would look to that image. And if they were bit and they looked and they believed in the Lord, they could find healing. And he's saying here, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so too when we look up to Jesus, we can find healing. And church, when you think about what he's talking about, you think about what was the serpent a representation of? It was a representation of the sin of the people. The rejection of God. What is the picture of Jesus lifted up on the cross a representation of? It's a representation of our sin. It's a representation of our rebellion against God. It is a representation that when we look to the very thing that is separated from God, that he took on for us, we find what? 
We find healing. We find peace with God. And so when we think about what Jesus had come to do, the triumphal entry was extraordinary. No, it didn't look like a a battle of war that was conquered in dominance in the worldly way. He came giving life, not taking it. He came giving life by giving up his own for you and for me. He came triumphantly coming in in peace to take upon your sin, separating himself from the Father so that we could have right relationship with him. And the only thing that he asked us to do is to look upon him. He became sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is nothing in the triumphal entry that is demanding us to work. The triumphal entry is about the one who came to do what we could not do. Remember how it said he went to get a colt, one that's never been ridden before. Because Jesus was coming to do what nobody has ever done before and nobody could ever do in future time and history ever. He came to be the perfect sacrifice for us. And church, he triumphantly came in peace so that we could have peace with God, so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that we could be restored into right relationship with the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our King. And that is who we celebrate. And that is who we serve and worship and participate in his work. But he's got to be your king. He's got to be the one you look to in faith to believe. He's not a good teacher. He's not some prophet. He is Lord. God orchestrated this time, precisely this time for him to come. For you and for me, showing incredible love, showing his mercy and grace and our Lord went to the cross willingly for you and for me does your life reflect the sacrifice given by Jesus let's pray Father God I just thank you for today and I thank you for your word I thank you for its beautiful power how everything comes together the beautiful pictures that you give us all throughout. From the very beginning, you were there. You will always be there. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ whom you sent. We thank you for his willingness to come, to live the life and to accomplish the works that we could not. And in your mercy and grace, you give us peace. Father, I know that there are folks in here today who don't have peace in their life. I first ask that you just, your spirit speaks to our hearts. Is our peace a wrestling because we truly haven't given our life to you for salvation. And we don't have peace with God because we have not given our life to Christ. And I pray you give us that spiritual peace but I understand that others, their peace is in their circumstance and they're struggling to find it because of what's going on in their life. Life is hard, life hurts. There are great struggles, there's great pain. But Father, I pray that as we see Jesus triumphantly going into Jerusalem, that his power, his lordship would reign in our life, that his sovereignty over all things would give us the peace that we need to get through those troubled times that we're in. Because he has promised to do good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. May we never forget that. And may we look to the beauty of the prophetic word to help us to be strengthened by you, to know that we can trust you, to know that you care and you love us and you are in pursuit of us and that you are supreme. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.